Hi, hello again on my scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. Once again, for the nth time, I introduce myself. My name is Krzysztof Waśniewski. I am assistant professor uh, with the Faculty of Management at the Andrzej Fritz Modrzewski University in Kraków, Poland. And this is my scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. Uh, today, the subject matter of my update on the blog is a little bit general. I am trying to take a scientifically pondered intellectual stance on that COVID-19 crisis. You will see that I will try to develop a behavioral approach to that whole uh, social phenomenon. Uh, and uh, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, once again, a reminder and an instruction for uh, my first time viewers uh, under the window with me in it you can see that uh, that inscription discover social sciences.com this is uh, the address of the website of uh, uh, with my scientific blog in it uh, so if you go to the description box below the video you will see a link discoversocialsciences.com you click on the link and it takes you to the website of my blog and on the website you will find an update which has the same title as this video that you are watching uh, if you watch this video let's say a long time after the publication of this update on the website of my blog, there is a little search window, so you just type there or you paste there the title of this video, and it will f and uh, um, on the site it will find you uh, the written update uh, corresponding to this video. So I am taking uh, on COVID nineteen and the lockdowns. These are like slide notes from my research log. Uh, dated May 2nd, 2020. Uh, as you can read uh, on the slide here, I am, I am trying to take a behavioral approach uh, to the COVID-19 crisis as a social phenomenon. So this, uh, uh, this video is a sort of split into two layers or two parts. First of all, I am trying to nail down the most salient facts, the most salient facts from my point of view in the COVID-19 crisis. Of course, I'm talking about social facts. I don't even pretend to be an epidemiologist or a biologist, so I, am, I will not pretend to, to know anything scientific about it. And the, so that's the first layer. And the second layer uh, corresponds to behaviorism, to like the fundamentals of the behavioral theory of the behavioral approach, so I will be referring a lot to the founding father of uh, the behavioral psychology, to Frederick Borges Skinner, and to a phenomenon which is common across science. You will see it, uh, because in science there are a lot of situations when some claims or some thoughts, some theses, are attributed to a scientist or to a scientific stream without essentially any reason at all, any material reason at all. And this is the case of behaviorism and the case of Mr. Skinner. So in this update behind the trying to outline my observations as regards the COVID-19 crisis, I am also trying to disentangle the bullshit uh, allegedly based on behaviorism that positive reinforcements always are or are always stronger than negative reinforcements or in other words that rewards are always stronger than punishments which is bullshit uh, but it is a matter of like having a pondered point of view on the thing so there is that claim uh, for example, I heard it expressed in a recent speech by the French president, Emmanuel Macron, the claim that lockdowns that we undertook to flatten down that pandemic curve under COVID-19, 
that those lockdowns are something unique in history, that never before have we done something like that. And here come, or here comes my general doubt about it, and I will, in, and in the first part of that presentation of that video, I will try to explain why I am skeptical about this point of view, about the claim that those lockdowns are something unique in history. I will, uh, in, in this presentation, in this video, I am introducing two passages from one of my favorite readings. It is the book entitled The Civilization and Capitalism, written by the French historian Fernand Brodel. And I'm most specifically re referring to volume one of this book. Here you have a citation, a quotation, a quote from, uh, from the, the book one. And it goes like that. Ebb and flow. Between the 15th and the 18th century, if the population went up or down, everything else changed as well. When the number of people increased, production and trade also increased. But the demographic growth is not an unmitigated blessing. It is sometimes beneficial and sometimes the reverse. When a population increases, its relationship to the space it occupies and the wealth at its disposal is altered. It crosses critical thresholds and at each one its entire structure is questioned afresh. I know that there is that well-established claim that we humans have already basically overpopulated our planet. I largely subscribe to this claim, but in this case, in this video, I want to take a slightly different turn on that. Uh, so my basic uh, assumption is that such episodes of drastically winding down our social activity, we know it from the past. This is why I brought forth that quote from Fernand Brodel. We, in our history, we have episodes of more or less purposeful shrinking of, let's say, the volume of our material civilization. And especially in the, in the case of Europe, the shrinking sometimes was really serious. We really meant business when we were winding down our European civilization. So my question that I will try at least, for which I will at least try to outline an answer in this video, is have we gone into lockdowns? during that pandemic COVID-19 out of sheer fear of an unknown danger or are we working through a deep social change with the positive expected outcomes? I am asking this question uh, because when I... Oh, 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 okay, here is like uh, my very personal take on, the, on those lockdowns. I was born and raised in a communist country, in the communist Poland. And I know by experience that even back then, in the 1970s or early 1980s, if the totalitarian government of the communist Poland wanted to lock the entire nation down in their homes, and uh, it would require a lot of military in the streets. And as a matter of fact, when we had that coup, uh, the introduction of, uh, of martial law in December 1981, Controlling the population required a lot of military and, as a matter of fact, the entire military in the streets. Now, those lockdowns went down amazingly, amazingly smoothly. We essentially locked ourselves in our houses uh, very like eagerly. And uh, my question is, are we like rats or mice uh, or coyotes? So are we like simply dodging an imminent threat in our environment or are we doing something more complex? My general question or the, the reason I, I ask this question from the theoretical point of view and, the, and, and I am going to develop that reason in this video is that essentially when we act out of fear uh, so when we respond to a negative reinforcement in our environment, 
our actions are usually very simple, very basic. Lockdowns are complex. This is complex social behavior, which requires a lot of coordination. We coordinate in that thing. And uh, here is a question. Maybe it is a purposeful action, a purposeful pattern of behavior reinforced by some positive stimuli in our environment. So here, once again, the claim that I consider like as like a partial summing up. The speed at which we enter into lockdowns indicates that we are demonstrating some virtually subconscious pattern of doing things. It is a learned civilizational pattern of behavior. It is not just simple manifestation of fear. So I assume further that lockdowns are complex social behavior and therefore they can be performed only to the extent of previously acquired learning. We need to have practiced some kind of lockdown style behavior earlier, maybe, gener uh, maybe generations earlier. And probably uh, this is why we can do it so massively and recurrently right now. And here comes my observation about that SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, it is a, a city boy, just as, as me. I am a city boy and this virus seems to be a, a city boy or a city girl, possibly because viruses essentially are asexual. Uh, it seems to be thriving in big urban agglomerations. And here comes an interesting fact that I brought up many times in, in my writings, that around 2007-2008, the percentage of urban population in the total population of our planet passed the threshold of 50%. Now we are around 55%, more than 55%. So that critical threshold that was mentioned in that passage from Fernand Brodel, which I mentioned a few slides ago, that critical threshold could be precisely the degree of, urban, uh, of urbanization. So the percentage of humans living in urban structures versus the percentage of humans who live in the so-called countryside. Interestingly, uh, in 2003, uh, when we have the last, much more local ep epidemic of the SARS-CoV-1 coronavirus, then uh, our uh, uh, coefficient of urbanization passed 43% at the global scale. These are like loose facts, but it is uh, it just jumps to my eyes. Here is a much more local fact. I am connecting here the COVID pandemic to another epidemic, much more local, the epidemic of Ebola in Africa, uh, which broke out, to my knowledge, uh, during the years 2014 and 2016. And that epidemic of Ebola has been sort of partly brought down only recently and as I heard even more uh, recently it is resurging. And three countries, three African countries were the most severely hit by the Ebola epidemic. They were Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. And interestingly, the moment when this epidemic of Ebola broke out in those countries, they were all passing a phase of intense urbanization. As you can see it in that table uh, against the background of which I am talking to you now. You can see those uh, that percentage of urban population in the total population. In Liberia, at the moment when uh, the epidemic of Ebola broke out in Liberia, that coefficient of urbanization was close to 50% and past 50%. Uh, in Guinea, it was passing the threshold of 36%. In Sierra Leone, it was passing the threshold of 41%. So it looks as if each specific society, each specific social structure, had a certain coefficient of urbanization, a certain percentage of people living in cities, 
that is sort of critical for its exposure to epidemic diseases. I wonder why I try to disentangle it on the basis rather of social sciences, because as I said, I am not a biologist and I am not going to pretend to be one. So, once again, uh, the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a city guy. It is a, a city boy. And uh, I think that it displays that specific trait uh, that enables it to spread specifically in urban agglomerations, that slow period of incubation. And I see it in the following way. COVID-1, so the SARS from 2003, was incubating very quickly. It exploded in densely populated urban areas, but we managed, as a civilization, we managed to, break, to bring it down quickly because it was incubating slowly. Ebola is incubating quite quickly too. It breaks out in densely populated places, but it is easy or relatively easy to bring down or to isolate because hosts are all symptomatic. They all have acute lethal symptoms. And this particular virus displays that adaptive trait. It incubates slowly so it can sort of circulate freely in those densely populated places uh, through by jumping from one asymptomatic host to another. So now the behavioral part. I am trying to add that part of behavioral theory, of behavioral science. So the, the basic claim, what happens to our human civilization depends very largely on what we do. Hmm? Of course there are external stressors, but our history shows that we are a tough species. We can adapt to external stressors. So the way we adapt is determinant for the way we further develop. And here comes another interesting quote from Fernand Brodel from the same book, Civilization and Capitalism, from the same chapter, The Weight of Numbers. And it goes like, looking more closely at Western Europe, one finds that there was a prolonged population rise between 1100 and uh, 1350, another between uh, 1450 and 1650, and a third after 1750. The last alone was not followed by a regression. Here we have three broad and comparable periods of biological expansion. The first two were followed by recessions, one extremely sharp between 1350 and 1450, the next rather less so between 1650 and 1750, better described as a slowdown than as a recession. Every recession solves a certain number of problems, removes the pressures and benefits the survivors. It is pretty drastic, but nonetheless a remedy. Inherited property became concentrated in a few hands immediately after the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century and the epidemics which followed and aggravated its effects. Only good land continued to be cultivated, less work for greater yield. The standard of living and real earnings of the survivors rose. Men only prospered for short intervals and did not realize it until it was already too late. I was, honestly, I was meditating over that passage in the context of the present events. I was asking myself over and over again, those lockdowns, our whole reaction to the pandemic, to what extent are we repeating, to what extent are we playing out a learned pattern of collective behavior, a, a pattern of winding down our social activity so as to sort of reset or reboot the social system. So now I go into the strictly spoken theory of behaviorism. I am referring to uh, Frederick Barhas Skinner uh, or Barhas Frederick Skinner. I, I, I am sorry, I misplaced his first and second name. Uh, here on the slide, you can see the cover of his uh, book, Dignity, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, 
However, I uh, like using his paper, his article from, 18, uh, from 1981, entitled Selection by Consequences, published in the journal Science. And as I announced earlier, what attracts my attention is the amount of bullshit which has accumulated over decades about the basic behavioral theory uh, by Burkhus Frederick Skinner. So there is that bullshit which uh, says that uh, behaviorism claims that negative reinforcements are always weaker than positive ones. And actually it is not true. Uh, every, I think every educated psychologist uh, and every social scientist, every biologist, anyone who ever has seen uh, uh, an MRI of a human brain working can tell you that negative reinforcement are, are much stronger. If I electrocute you, it is a much stronger stimulus than any reward I can propose you. So negative reinforcement are always stronger, but they are much simpler and less flexible, less workable. Negative reinforcement convey much less meaning than positive reinforcements. That's the thing to understand. And I am bringing this up in the context of the subject matter of this video because I tell to myself that if our collective reaction to pandemic is most of all a manifestation of fear, if lockdowns are a manifestation of fear, fear is simple. It is a, it, it is a, a basic reaction to a negative stimulus. Reaction uh, or behavior based on fear is very simple and uncoordinated and we are very coordinated in our lockdowns. So here comes another thing uh, in the written version of this update that you can find on the website of my blog. You can find the description of uh, an exhaustive description of an experiment that even you can conduct with yeast. So with those small living buggers, cousins to, uh, cousins to fungi uh, that we use to make beer, that we use to make, to make bread. Uh, essentially, the basic claim is all living organisms are naturally exploratory in their, in their environment. And exploratory behavior is reinforced by positive and negative stimuli. So we humans as a civilization are exploratory and external stimuli direct our exploration. So here comes like a big piece of science, big piece of, of theory, essentially directly from, uh, from Mr. Skinner. Positive stimulation triggers the building up of a strategy. Here is a, a literal quote from Skinner. A better way of making a tool, growing food or teaching a child is reinforced by its consequence. The tool, the food or a useful helper, respectively. A culture evolves when practices originating in, its, uh, in this way contribute to the success of the practicing group in solving its problems. It is the effect on the group and uh, not the reinforcing consequences for individual members which is responsible for the evolution of the culture. So once again, jumping to those COVID-related lockdowns, what is important is the collective impact on our civilization, not individual impact on particular people. So, Burkhus Frederick Skinner uh, claimed, and I very much subscribe to this claim, that humans, we humans, have a unique ability to scale and combine positive reinforcements so we can purposefully use something that thought of a better word could be called pleasure. And our ability to use uh, positive reinforcements uh, in that complex, scalable way allowed us to build our civilization, allowed us to learn and develop those complex patterns of behavior which make us into a society. 
and those complex civilization-making patterns of both our individual and collective behavior are shaped through positive reinforcements. And negative reinforcements, or failures if you want, serve as alert systems that, uh, that correct our course of learning. Once again, the question is, what have we learned during those lockdowns and what have we learned regarding the pandemic? That's the big question, because what we have learned now, we will be playing out uh, right after the lockdowns are over. We will be playing out that collective learning, that collectively learned patterns in the months to come. And here comes like my last piece of literature in this in this video in this update because i mentioned that uh, that case that interesting observation of epidemics breaking out in correlation or in something like a correlation in concurrence uh, with uh, uh, our growing urbanization now the question is why as a civilization are we more and more urbanized? Uh, this is a question of social roles and it is connected to demographic growth. If we are a growing population, every consecutive generation brings more people to the planet. So in every consecutive generation, there are more people than in any of the preceding generations which means that in each new generation, new social roles need to emerge because those people simply have to be employed to the benefit of the society. And by employment, I don't just mean a work contract. I mean any kind of social activity which makes a person useful to the society and which sort of anchors this person in the social structure. So with demographic growth, each consecutive generation needs more different social roles. And uh, here comes the specific difference between a city and the countryside. The city is sort of flexible in creating new social roles for new people who come there. Uh, but on the other hand, the countryside or non-urban uh, non human settlements, they are much more rigid. They are much more rigid in the partitioning of space. They are much more rigid in the definition of social roles. Huh? This is why it is much easier to start a completely new type of business in a city. And it is bloody hard to start a completely new type of business in the countryside, in, the, in what we could call the province. And here comes my last piece of literature. So a quote from Thomas Malthus from his essay on the principle of population. It comes from chapter four. Uh, it is like an echo of what I have just said about those social roles in the urban environment and in the countryside. The sons of tradesmen and farmers are exhorted not to marry and generally find it necessary to pursue this advice till they are settled in some business or farm that may enable them to support a the family. These events may not perhaps occur till they are far advanced in life. The scarcity of farms is a very general complaint in England, and the competition in every kind of business is so great that it is not possible that all should be successful. So essentially with demographic growth, we need the cities in order to accommodate a growing number of people. We just need cities. Uh, we cannot afford to get rid of urban lifestyle at all. Uh, what we need to do is to figure out like the right way to, to live in the cities so as to be less exposed to such crisis as the COVID-19. Okay, that would be all in this video. Once again, a reminder. In the description box below the video, you have a link, discoversocialsciences.com. You click on the link, which takes you to the website of my blog, Discover Social Sciences. And there you can find a written update with the body text and numbers and everything, which has the same title as this specific video. So have a nice weekend, have a nice reading 
and I hope uh, those thoughts I shared in this video will be somehow useful to you. Bye.